So as we've seen, we have these three different study designs, all of which provide some evidence for a causal relationship between the exposure and the disease, but different degrees of evidence. So the RCT provides the best evidence, but we can't always use an RCT because um, if we have an exposure that we think might lead to increased risk, we can't um, intervene and um, expose uh, half of the people in our study to something that we think will increase risk. So um, the classic case is um, tobacco use, smoking cigarettes. So over the years, as there was more evidence built for the case that smoking caused lung cancer and other problems, um, the tobacco companies constantly said, we can't, you can't prove that because you need a randomized controlled trial to experimentally prove it. And uh, that really was unethical since the evidence was building. So we need a set of criteria to use um, with cohort and case control studies for deciding when we have good evidence for causality. And actually, this isn't just for cohort and case control. It's for all of them. So what I'm going to talk about now are the Bradford Hill uh, criteria for causation. So there are nine of these Bradford Hill criteria for inferring causation, and um, I am going to tell you about the most important ones. Okay, so the first one is consistency. So a relationship between an exposure and a disease that is repeatedly observed across multiple studies and multiple settings is more likely to be causal. So this is um, similar to what you hear about the you know study replication. So even if there's one study out there that shows a relationship between exposure and disease, that's not enough to really justify the assumption that there's a causal relationship between them. So you need to replicate um, that study in order to uh, really have strong evidence for the causal relationship. The next uh, causal criterion that's really important is temporality. So causes precede effects. So if you have a an exposure and you know it came before the disease, then that's a better evidence for a causal relationship. So this is one reason why a cross-sectional study isn't a great, doesn't provide great evidence for causal relationship because you're only looking at the causes and effects in a single time point, and so you don't know which one came first. Um, this is also, can be sometimes true of a case control study. You, um, you know, when you have your cases, you see what, how many of those cases have um, been exposed and compare that to the controls, but you don't actually know whether the exposure, often you don't know whether the exposure came before or after the disease. So um, that's one of the reasons why case control is not as strong evidence for causality as the other study designs. The next important causal criterion is the dose-response relationship, or you can call it the biological gradient. So what this says is that with an increasing amount of the exposure, you should get an increased risk of the disease. So this is why often you'll see studies breaking down an exposure into different levels and showing that the risk of the disease changes with the exposure level it's because this provides good evidence that the exposure is causally related to the disease. Now, it's not a requirement for a causal relationship, but it supports a causal relationship. Um, the next causal criteria, there are two different ones, but they're very related. So plausibility is that the relationship between the exposure and disease can be explained by um, plausible biological events or biological relationships. And coherence is similar. The causal conclusion shouldn't contradict biological knowledge that currently exists. So um, this just means that the causal relationship is, you know, consistent with what we know about the world. Now, of course, sometimes there are scientific revolutions, and so this, you know, isn't a guarantee of causal relationship that it's consistent with what has come before. 
but um, it does provide better evidence than if you have a relationship that doesn't really make sense given current biological knowledge. And finally, this is consistent with what we've talked about so far. So experimental evidence um, provides a good um, support for a causal relationship. So if the condition or disease can be altered by an appropriate intervention. So if you do a randomized controlled trial where you manipulate the exposure and you show that that affects the disease, <clears throat> then that provides the best kind of evidence for a causal relationship. But that's only if you can do a randomized controlled trial, and as we discussed, you cannot always do a randomized controlled trial, in which case the other criteria that we've just discussed are really good um, rules of thumb for deciding how strong a causal relationship is.